I'm gonna tell you a story as well. You know, I, um, I used to resent the fact that I didn't have a, a crazy testimony to share. You know, I, I didn't have a, a, a drug addiction. You know, I, I uh, was never a gang member. I never went to jail. Um, and I would hear these amazing testimonies and feel like, I don't know if I could relate to that, you know? Uh, it's amazing that that happened. It's amazing God can forgive the unforgivable. He can redeem the, the unredeemable, you know? But, uh, but I always felt like, I always felt like, what about, what about me? Like, where do I find myself in the story? Because the truth is, I was something much more dangerous than a drug addict or a gang member. I was a pretty good kid. So I thought I was okay. My youth pastor thought I was okay. My mom thought I was okay. My teachers thought I was okay. But I was what the Bible would call an enemy of God, an object of wrath. Because I, I thought, because I'd look at other people and say, well, at least I'm not that bad. At least I, I haven't fallen into sin that deep. You know, at, at least my life isn't in that much trouble. You know, God got a hold of my life in, in 2006 is when I had a, a life-changing encounter with him. And, uh, and I started the next year, I, I joined this band and we went on tour and I, I just started sharing Jesus at our concerts. And... Um, I'll never forget one day, just a couple months after starting this band, I'm, I'm in, you know, what I would call ministry. I'm sharing the gospel every night. People are responding to the message of Jesus. And, uh, you know, this, this woman we'd stayed with the night before, her kids were fans of our band. And so she'd invited us to stay at her house. And, uh, and, uh, and she, she woke up early in the morning and I sort of heard her kind of bustling around in the house and, and she said, hey, Maddie, I'm gonna go soak at the church. Do you wanna come? I thought, oh, your church has a hot tub? I, sounds great. Um, but uh, she said, We're just, I'm just gonna turn on worship music and just spend time with God. And I said, sure, that sounds, that sounds cool. And so, um, and so I'm gonna do my best to describe this story to you. So we show up to this little church there in Indiana where she lived and... Um, and she turns on this music that, you know, was not good. Like, I, it was distracting for me. It sounded like the guy singing was just making it up as he went. It's probably Jason Upton, if I had to guess, honestly. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I'm sort of sitting here like, what are we listening to, you know? And, but this lady, she knows what to do. She kicks her shoes off and she just cranks it up, man. She's praying for her husband. She's praying for her kids by name. She's praying for her pastor. She's praying for her church, her city, her city officials, the, the sh sheriff in town, you know, the, the police officers, the city mayor, um, the state governor, like she is praying, you know, this mom is, is praying. And, uh, and so I'm sitting in this room thinking yeah, how much longer, right? And, uh, you know, as I'm sitting there sort of awkwardly regretting my decision to come with her into this moment, there's this sort of echo of a phrase that I had heard when I was a, a child. It was like, I, I, I kept hearing or thinking this, this thought, seek his face, seek his face. And, um, and so I, I, I remember sitting there in, in the chair and I, I said, all right, God, uh, this is it, I'm gonna seek your face, here we go. <sighs> you know. God, I'm seeking your face. And after a minute or two of this, I, I had to say, Lord, I don't even know what that means. I talk about you. You know, I, uh, I want to know you, but I don't even know what it means to spend time with you. I'm a Christian leader. I, sh I share the gospel every day. It's not a gospel that has come alive in me. It's, it's a gospel that I heard other people preach. And uh, people respond and you move in their lives. And, um, but I, I remember sitting there and I said, God, I don't know how to seek your face. I don't even know where to start, but I, I just want to be with you where you are. And I, I'll do my best to describe this. It, it, was, 
immediately it was, it was like the room I was in disappeared. Like the room I was in fell out from under me. The chair I was sitting in, the music this woman was listening to, her prayer and, and pacing around the room, like none of that was there anymore. And, uh, and it felt like I was just in this room that was full of light that just went on. It had a, a ceiling and a floor that just went on forever. It's a room with no walls that was so bright that I could, um, it, it was like I had to adjust my, my eyes for a minute. You know, I, it was shocking, overwhelming to the senses. And, uh, and as my eyes began to adjust, I saw this silhouette of a, of a man walking toward me. And as he got closer, it's like my heart began to sing inside of my chest. Because I knew that this is that one I'd read about, the one I'd talked about, the one I had come to church and sang songs about my whole life, but I'd never been with him. This was, this was Jesus walking toward me. And uh, you know, as he got closer and closer, I, I began to see his features. He had this big smile on his face and he walks up to me and he says, Maddie, I'm so happy you're here. He said, I've, I've prepared a place for you. Come, let me show you. And he, he holds his hand out to, uh, to take my hand. And as I, I reach for his hand, I notice that there's a, a hole through it. And, and the contrast, you know, this beautiful room, I, like, I wish I could explain it to you. It wasn't just white fluorescent light, like maybe we're used to. It was this light that was, that was every color, this sort of prismatic moving, living light that was all throughout this room. And it was like the same light was emanating from his, his eyes as he smiled and as he reached his hand out in this amazing, beautiful, indescribable place. I saw this scar on his hand in the contrast between the ugliness of the scar and the beauty of the place in which we were standing. It was shocking for me. And I, I suddenly realized when I saw his hand that, that he had scars, not just on his, his hand, but all the way up his arms, onto his neck in his head, and his face. He was brutally scarred. And so I, I took his hand, but I, I hesitated. I didn't follow him. And he turned back to me and, and, and looked at me and I, I just sort of rubbed my thumb over the, the hole in his hand. And I looked up and said, did it hurt? And, uh, and he stopped and, and turned around and he looked back at me and he looked around at the place we were standing in and he smiled. And he sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, it was worth it. And you know, I, uh, as quickly as I'd found myself in that place, upon hearing that phrase, it was worth it. I, I found myself back in this church, but now laying on my face on the floor, weeping in the presence of the Lord with this revelation, overwhelmed and undone with this revelation of the brutality of the cross. and the depth of the, the suffering Jesus endured for my sake. The Jesus who was mocked and beaten and spit on, who was scourged and whipped with the cat of nine tails. So severely, the Bible says that you could count his ribs inside of his body. The Jesus who had a crown of thorns mockingly fashioned and placed on his head and then beaten down into his skull with rods. Jesus, who had a, a, a false king's robe placed on his shoulders by the men that had struck him and spit on him. And then who was made to carry his cross through the city while the people he came to save, some of whom just days earlier had cried out to him, Hosanna to the son of David carried his cross foot after foot through the city, step after step toward this hill, this place of the skull. And uh, every step of the way, Jesus had a choice. You know, he, he said even prior to any of this, he said, no one takes my life. I lay it down of my own accord. And so he, he had a choice to step out of the suffering when they were spitting him and insulting him. He had a choice to step out of the suffering when they were whipping his, his back, scourging him and shredding it to ribbons. He had a, 
a choice to step out of the suffering when they put the crown of thorns on his head and he chose to stay through it all. And then after being nailed to the cross and hung up to suffocate to death, he just died. He just died with no sort of dramatic camera angles or music in the background. The king of glory, brutalized and beaten and hanging dead on a cross like a common criminal. And if that was the end of the story, none of us would be here today. But thank God that was not the end of the story. Thank God that three days later, people coming to tend to the body found out that Jesus wasn't who anyone could have possibly imagined he was. Because the tomb they came to to find his body in was empty. The stone was rolled away. And Jesus is alive today and forevermore having conquered death and now looking back, looking back over the suffering he endured, that he would look at me of all people who am the the chief of sinners and say, it was worth it all so that you could have me and I could have you. Is I think the mystery of all mysteries It's like I've studied now for 15 years the scriptures. I've studied for 15 years the gospel. I've studied for 15 years atonement theory, soteriology, the, the study of salvation. It's like for 15 years I've studied these principles and I still have never met anyone that can adequately answer the question, why? I can understand how God saves me, but why? Why would God in his infinite mercy, glorious grace, in his perfection, his unsearchable holiness, why would he look at me and say, I see your sin and I want you anyway? Why would he look at you and say, I see the price that must be paid for your deliverance, your healing or your hope, but I want you anyway that the Bible would say after, at the end of it all, that it was for the joy set before him, that he endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame and sat down at the right hand of glory. We are today living testaments to the radical, revolutionary and relentless love of Jesus Christ, the King. That he would, at the end of it all, say, no, it wasn't easy. It wasn't fun. But it was the only way for your salvation. And so I signed up. I volunteered. And I took on death willingly. You know, I've been reading a lot this week in Isaiah chapter 53. And um, I don't normally do this, but uh, normally I teach out of a different translation, but Isaiah 53 in the Passion Translation is so beautiful. I thought it, it would be uh, worthwhile to visit this morning. In, uh, in verse four of Isaiah 53, I'll start in verse four of Isaiah 53. Now to give you some context here, these words were written about one who would come one day, Isaiah saw prophetically a, a child that would be born who would ultimately become king of the world and that would become king who would deliver his people not by military might or strategy, but by sacrificial love. And so he's describing this king in Isaiah chapter 53. And, uh, and he says this in, in Isaiah 53, starting in verse four. He says, yet he was the one who carried our sicknesses and endured the torment of our sufferings. We viewed him as one who was being punished for something he himself had done, as one who was struck down by God and brought low. But it was because of our rebellious deeds that he was pierced, and because of our sins that he was crushed. He endured the punishment that made us completely whole. 
And in his wounding, we found our healing. In his wounding, we found our healing. In verse seven, it says, he was oppressed and harshly mistreated. Still he humbly submitted, refusing to defend himself. He was led like a gentle lamb to be slaughtered, like a silent sheep before his shearers. He didn't even open his mouth by coercion and with the, a, a perversion of justice, he was taken away. And who could have imagined his future? He was cut down in the prime of life for the rebellion of his own people. He was struck down in their place. They gave him a grave among criminals, but he ended up instead in a rich man's tomb. Although he had done no violence nor spoken deceitfully, even though it pleased Yahweh to crush him with grief, he will be restored to favor. After his soul becomes a guilt offering, he will gaze upon his many offspring and prolong his days. And through him, listen to this, and through him, Yahweh's deepest desires will be fully accomplished. Through him, Yahweh's deepest desires will be accomplished. Through him, Yahweh's deepest desires will be accomplished. Now there's this old song how deep the Father's love for us that describes the cross and it says, um, the, the, as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. What is Yahweh's deepest desire? To bring many sons to glory. To make sinners into sons. To make enemies into beloved family. To bring people who'd set themselves in sin and rebellion against God to bring them to forgiveness, to hope, to freedom, all for his glory, that the, that the cosmos, that all creation would marvel at the infinite wisdom, grace, and unsearchable love of God the Father. And so, I want you to know that this whole thing for us over the last four years has been for one reason only, that is to see the, the heart cry of Jesus become a reality, to see the prayer of Jesus answered. And in his prayer, he said, Father, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So everything we do to establish this church, everything we do to, to open the doors so that you can come in, everything we have, have done to help put ourselves on a collision course with you in this moment has been for one reason only, and that is so that Jesus would have his glory in your life. So that you would have his peace and his power upon which to build day after day, year after year, and generation after generation. And so, um, I'm gonna give you an opportunity. We just... Uh, I can't get past this. You know, there's this story that shaped my life for years of two, uh, two young Moravian missionaries. Those of you that have been to the church for some time, you, you've heard me share this story. These two young missionaries heard of, a, of an, an, an island in the West Indies, a small island in the West Indies owned by a godless man who uh, had a, a group of slaves that worked this island for him. And he refused to allow any missionaries to come and visit the island. And, and so these two young men who had tried to go there to reach these slaves, they came up with a novel idea. And what they did is they, they sold themselves into a lifetime of slavery so that they themselves could be a light on this island. In fact, their families didn't even get money for the sale. They had to use the money to transport themselves to the island. This wasn't a one-way ticket or, or, or this wasn't a round-trip ticket. It wasn't something that they could come back from after a couple years. Or it wasn't a, a, a term of service. It was a lifetime of harsh, brutal slavery just so that they might, by some miracle, be able to proclaim Jesus and see sons and daughters, slaves being raised on this island, brought, it to, brought into the family of God. And so... The day finally came and their families came to see them off as these two young men uh, climbed aboard this ship that would take them to the island for the rest of their lives. And uh, the two of them climb onto this ship after saying their goodbyes. And as the ship is pulling away from the harbor, they throw their arms around each other and one of them waves his arm 
back to those on the shore and he shouts this phrase. He says, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And that would be the last words ever spoken or ever heard by these two young men as they spent the rest of their lives enslaved on this island. But that phrase, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering became the, 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 the mantra, the, the central uh, message of, of a movement that would send hundreds of thousands of missionaries all over the world that would transform cultures and communities to the ends of the earth. And this is the same thing that moves us today, that the lamb that was slain would receive the reward of his suffering. Everything that we do is that justice might be served, that Jesus might get in your life exactly what he paid for. And that is your liberation, your transformation, and your adoration. Your liberation, your transformation, and your adoration. And so, in just a moment, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond to this message. Oh, whether it was the Jesus that, uh, the picture of Jesus that, that Jacob painted or the picture of Jesus that Brian painted or the picture of Jesus that I've painted, I, I want you to know that there is one Jesus and that if you spend the rest of eternity seeking him, pursuing him and walking with him, you'll still only be scratching the surface of his glory, his beauty, his wisdom, and his love. So would you, would you stand with me this morning? In just a moment, I want to give some of you an opportunity, as Brian said, to make a public declaration. I wouldn't just say of your faith, a public declaration of your need for Jesus. To say, not just, Lord, that I believe in you, but to say, Lord, I need you to save me. I need you to save my family. I need you to set me free from this addiction I've been suffering under. Lord, I need you to set me free from my unbelief, from my doubt, from my depression, from these suicidal thoughts and impulses. Lord, I need you. I've tried it my own way. I've tried it in the way of the world, but there is no hope there. There is no freedom there. There is no power there. Lord Jesus, I, I wanna make you the Lord of my life. And I need you to accept me. And over are the days of begging people to have pity on Jesus and to accept him into your heart. Friend, Jesus doesn't need your acceptance. You need his. Hear this, Jesus doesn't need your acceptance. He's the king, whether you acknowledge it or not. You need his acceptance. So in just a moment, I'm gonna to count to three. And when I count to three, if your heart is burning inside you and you're saying, you know what? I've been, I've been attending church maybe my whole life. Maybe this is your first time ever at a church service. Maybe you've been in pastoral ministry, but you realize this morning that Jesus is not the Lord of your life. He's been a, an accessory in it. He's just an idea, a concept, but he's not been the king who commands and directs and guides you. You've not been a disciple of Jesus, you've been a fan. And this morning you're ready to say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life and I don't ever wanna go back again. In just a moment, I'm gonna to count to three. And when I count to three, I want you to come as fast as you possibly can to this, to this altar. As fast as you possibly can to this altar. Me, Brian, and I don't know where Jacob's at. I'm sure he's running around here. We would love the chance to pray for you. We're gonna lay hands on some people and we are gonna see the power of Jesus demonstrated in your life. Just as we've seen earlier, it's been demonstrated in the lives of countless others in this room, amen? So I want you to come. One, two, three. Come now, come now, come now. Don't wait, don't worry about the person next to you. Come now, come now. If Jesus has been anything less than the Lord of all of your life, come now to this altar. Come now to forgiveness. Come now to hope. Come now to newness of life. Come on. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on.